Thank you for joining us for this panel event, the use of AI in HR, challenges and opportunities for AI recruitment technology. I'm very excited to welcome you tonight and to welcome our extremely esteemed chair and panelists. Chairing the session tonight is Jonathan Black, the director of the University of Oxford Careers Service and a professorial fellow at New College Oxford. And our four panelists are Dr. Nigel Gwinol, Senior Lecturer and Director of Research for the Institute of Management at Goldsmiths, University of London. Kiati Sundaram, the CEO at Applied. Dr. Ali Simonovsky, Director of Product Science at the Predictive Index. And Dr. Sarah Myers-West, Postdoctoral Researcher at AI Now Institute, New York University. This event has been funded by the Mindaroo Oxford Challenge Fund in AI Governance, which aims to dramatically expand the notion of artificial intelligence ethics to fully embrace seismic challenges that contemporary digital technologies pose to labor, institutions, and public scrutiny. I'm also delighted that the Women's Forum for Economy and Society are supporting partners for this event. The Women's Forum is the leading international platform for highlighting women's voices and creating a more inclusive future for all through building an active community, developing multi-stakeholder dialogues, launching calls to action and encouraging decision makers. A little housekeeping. We are fortunate to have a varied audience with a wide range of views and we request the opinions of others are respected in this space. For your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website following the event. You can ask questions using the Q&A tab at any time, and these will be answered towards the end of the talk. Questions will be visible to all attendees, but can be asked anonymously, and all questions can be upvoted and commented on. We will endeavor to follow up any unanswered queries. Please allow me now to introduce you to our chairperson of this event, Jonathan Black. Thank you very much, Clemmy, and welcome everybody and welcome to my panellists here. Looking forward to a very challenging and interesting talk. Um, and welcome everybody. I know that only 40% uh, of the audience from that survey are actually in the UK and uh, fully 30% in North America. So um, if we don't get a chance, uh, happy Thanksgiving for later in the week. And I am um, uh, and indeed uh, some of our speakers are from North America too. Um, and it looks like from the survey, which I think you've had a chance to see, we have about a 50-50 split between those who are pretty positive about AI in recruitment and those who are neutral to, hmm, not sure. Hopefully this panel will answer many of those questions as we go along. But let's get us all onto the same page about AI. And I thought we should start by trying to define what we're going to be talking about. Um, so first, Nigel, could I turn to you to um, define the different types of AI or automated recruitment systems, please? You're muted, Nigel. There we are. Yep, mandatory unmuting. So um, I'm, I see, uh, I'll talk about the different areas where I see it being applied in uh, recruitment. We see it applied all across HR, but in recruitment, we see it uh, in candidate attraction. So how do we get people to apply for job roles in the first place? And we see that in uh, you know active attraction where we go out and we try to identify candidates, but also passive attraction where we um, implement chatbots on our careers site so that it can engage with um, you know job applicants. And the idea is anything that you want done 24 hours a day, seven days a week that you want to be able to do for hundreds of thousands of people and do at scale, um, people putting AI on. So candidate attraction is the first way. The, the next kind of area that we're seeing in recruitment, at least, is in the hiring phase and the sorting and the sifting of candidates. And there, what we're seeing is that people are using uh, new data collection methodologies. So they're using recorded interviews, for instance. Some people are looking at social media uh, profiles like uh, Twitter, maybe Facebook, if they're brave. Um, and somehow they've got to make sense of this video, this audio, this text, and machine learning is great at summarizing data like that. So it's being used in hiring um, 
it's being used as hiring as well. We see it across the other areas of HR as well. Um, but since we're talking about recruitment, I'll probably pause there. Excellent. So candidate attraction and then hiring, filtering and, re and reducing the numbers. And as we've seen from uh, some of the major corporations, they're getting tens to hundreds of thousands of applicants. And so get any, um, any uh, automation they can get help um, they're seeing is good. So um, let's go on. To, I'd like to now turn to people in the industry on the other side, if you like. Um, and about how these systems are designed. Kiati, can we start with you on that one? Yes, thanks, Jonathan. So my view is uh, I'm cautiously optimistic about AI, but at Applied, we don't yet use AI because we don't think we can have safe implementation. And that's where I empathize with the half of the audience that is skeptical with implementation of technology. Uh, but to go on, on what Nigel mentioned, uh, Within Applied, we're looking at all of the various points in hiring, including attraction, sourcing, testing, and unbiased evaluation of candidates. Um, and it's very interesting when you look at the data that is being collected. Um, quite often, we see that there is this need to summarize and understand this varied amount of data that exists. But the premise of Applied is a lot of the data that you're using in hiring is incorrect because it will lead and perpetuate biases that have always existed. Um, so the three pillars of applied is test on what matters. It is not data that sits on Facebook. It is not data that sits on arguably not even on LinkedIn because a lot of it is self-validation uh, and it's not properly validated. Um, so what do you test on? You should test on skills. Um, you should de-bias the entire process. And how do we do that? That is a bigger question. Um, and also add in a layer of data that is actually predictive and correlated with talent. And, and that's where the conflict with AI comes. It is not a philosophical conflict. As I mentioned, I'm already very positive. It is about implementation. So unless we are fully satisfied that we can have safe implementation of AI, where it has not perpetuated all of the historic outcomes, um, because we know tech tools are unforgiving, and human society has quite often fudged things in the past, and tech tools will highlight those fudges, and we don't want to do that at Applied. That's where I'll stop. Okay, uh, well, you're, you're throwing up some great points straight away, but I'm going to, just sticking with the functionality, Ali, can you talk to us about, from, from your side of it, what the, the, how it's designed to work? Sure, so I think one of the, the key benefits of the potential of AI in hiring is its ability to use unstructured data, which both Kiati and Nigel touched upon. So typically when we talk data in interviewing, I think people tend to think of assessments that people get a score on or multiple scores in multiple areas. What can be done now is web scraping, as Nigel mentioned, Facebook, which is kind of terrifying, uh, LinkedIn, various other profiles it could scrape people's resumes. So we're not relying on a person to look at the resume, which I know many recruiters and sourcers are thrilled about because it does boost that scalability. But that functionality is allowing us to take data points that we previously weren't able to actually analyze properly without active human intervention, like resumes, like interviews, like uh, preliminary phone screens. And it's definitely a huge opportunity. Like Kiati, I'm very cautiously optimistic and think we need to figure out how it works in other areas of HR before making the critical employment decisions on the basis there. But it definitely holds a lot of potential and is reading from a lot of different sources. So it's one of the tools that we can use. Um, Sarah, you're, you're, I'd like to move slightly on into the, um, the well, is, are they the drawbacks? I think Kiat has already started talking about some of those and mentioning some, but the, the other side of it, here is this tool that could do wonders. It can measure all sorts of things that we don't measure now, um, but are there some drawbacks to this? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd first emphasize that the systems that we're talking about today are already really in wide use um, across all different kinds of employment categories, um, you know, different kinds of industry verticals. Um, but these systems are really designed like the customers that the, the companies are seeking to port are employers more so than job candidates. And that, that really shapes, I think the, um, 
the philosophy and the values that underlie a lot of these systems. They're, they're designed, I think, often for efficiency, um, for giving data that can be, you know, useful to employers uh, to, you know, quell worries about accountability or liability. Um, but what we don't see often is disclosure to applicants when these systems are in use. Um, they, they don't necessarily know what kinds of qualifications were taken into account when decisions were made around hiring. Um, they're not often informed about what kind of bias a, a given system might encode or why they didn't get a job. Um, and the, the challenge that that really presents is that um, candidates and applicants um, are thus not really able to identify or marshal evidence um, when discrimination does take place, let alone be able to aggregate the data that would be necessary in order to challenge it. Um, and so I think that the, the really uh, significant um, challenge that these systems pose is that they, they can work to entrench and amplify long-standing patterns of inequality around hiring and there's lots of um you know case examples that can support that um but in ways that render it much more invisible to candidates um and much harder to to push back on and so i think as they draw greater scrutiny and, and we can talk later there's a lot of um you know interest from different uh regulators in the united states um around um around regulating these tools, I think it's really important that the, the focus be on the needs of the applicants and the workers um, who end up being discriminated against, um, recognizing that really the customers that the, com that the companies are focused on are the employers and recruiters. So sort of shifting, shifting the balance through, um, through regulatory scrutiny. Right, so they're being, <clears throat> Obviously, the companies who make these systems are selling them to the employers because the employers are paying for them. The employers are using them to save money. We know <clears throat> from some of the literature that, um, for example, Unilever claimed they'd saved a million pounds in recruitment costs one year and 100,000 hours of recruitment. So they're clearly, if they work, which I think was Chiarty's or Ali's point, then, then, then they can be very effective. Let's drill down a bit, because we've heard a lot recently in other scenarios about algorithms and the rules that people write. You've touched there that these algorithms can be invisible, or we don't know who's writing them, or we're dependent on the coders right at the bottom who are actually coding these systems. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the philosophy and the algorithms behind this and how these are driven, because that's presumably where bias will creep in. Uh, who'd like to go on that, Nigel? Yeah, I, I just to say I agree with uh, with the point so far. I think it's like um, yeah, you have to you have to look at it kind of skeptically when you're or critically when you're having a look at what these systems are doing. They're trying to kind of make money or save money. That seems to be the the combination. But in terms of uh, the algorithms, I think I was on a call with. Uh, well-funded AI startup and asked them if they had IO psychologists or social scientists and they said on the call no we have data scientists and I think when you hear that it's just the data scientists without any of the social science you um you need to worry that that kind of signals alarm bells to me you need people thinking about this from different um from different perspectives and the big lesson for firms using these assessments and you know wondering about the algorithms is just whether there was diversity in the design of the algorithms. So the worst thing that can happen is uh, a bunch of people design it and they don't think about diversity at all. And they're ta-da, here it is. Do you know what you need to do is find out who all of the stakeholders are all the way along and include them at all of the points in the process. And I think then you'll be able to imagine the situations that you don't want to encounter and kind of address them before they occur. Sarah. <clears throat> Sarah. Yeah, if I can jump in, I would actually maybe push a little bit on the premise of the, the question too, that the bias is sort of limited to the algorithm itself. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think that there are reasons to think about the broader implementation of these systems as potentially introducing forms of discrimination. And a, a couple of things in particular come to mind. Um, 
one is I think in the wake of the pandemic, we saw this like shift to remote schooling and remote work that raised lots of questions around the digital divide. Who has you know high speed broadband access? Who has access to devices? Um, and and so I think that the you know if you have to let's say play a, a mobile phone game in order to as as part of the recruitment process, well that might exclude certain. Um, certain candidates on the basis of, of their access to technology. Um, I think that there's there's also some evidence of, of new forms of bias um, that can be introduced, particularly around um, you know people with disabilities um, and certain kinds of assessments. Um, just inherently in their in the way that they function are are going to to introduce those norm, those forms of discrimination. So I think it's it's useful to look at the the broader um, scope of you know, all the way from the the development process to implementation, um, with that with that in mind, and not not solely focus on that question of can we debias an algorithm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ali. There's also the notion of uh, some of these companies sharing we get the bias out of hiring and we're protecting candidates and we're protecting you, our client, the organization, which is extremely dangerous and misleading. And I think many of us here know there is no such thing as any kind of hiring intervention or any kind of workplace decision or any decision period that is not going to contain some kind of bias in some way or that is foolproof and that we're ensuring there's no bias there. Uh, and I, I think that's a, a big challenge that we're facing in terms of AI and hiring is appropriately demonstrating here are the risks of bias, here's how it can help, but those risks are still there and might even be different than what one might be accustomed to uh, thinking about when going into an interview or some other kind of hiring situation. Yeah, I mean, I suppose one issue is to, to quote your current president in his run up don't compare this system with the almighty, compare it with the alternative, which is human beings doing it and, and all the bias that's there. So, um, Kiati, what do you think? Is that, is that, are we trying uh, to hold it, these uh, systems to a, to a too high a standard? Well, I do resonate with that. I mean, algorithms and artificial intelligence are not foolproof, but neither are humans. And all of the evidence shows that if we leave it to humans, we are more likely than not going to hire in our own likeness. All of the biases thing, and a very simple example, affinity bias, we will end up hiring like ourselves, which is why it's such a big problem in tech. It is very homogenous. So where do you draw the line? Is it humans? Is it computers? What, what is the intersection? So my view is we need to have some automation because that's the worldwide trend. You can't get away with it, but you need to have human oversight. And how do you map that? So it's no longer about artificial intelligence in isolation. How do you build systems that are augmented or enabling human decision making? And I think that's the that's the intersection that will become really important. So it's the <clears throat> it's the fourth person in the room who's saying hang on a minute you've forgotten that candidate you've overlooked that person you've overlooked that thousand people because of what have you um so they, uh, nigel you talked at the beginning about where ai is used in the pipeline if you like uh, where is the best use for it then if given it can eliminate bias or reduce bias sorry completely. yeah I, I think it's probably um helpful if i just say where i stand on mm -hmm. uh, on the idea of ai you know um, like Sarah was saying earlier, it's out there, you know, the kind of genies out of the, the bottle. And um, I think that it can be used effectively in candidate attraction. I think it can be used effectively uh, in hiring, um, but I think it's more often used poorly than it's used well. And I think that that's the situation that we're, um, that we're currently in. And I think you have to ask yourself, what's the incentive for uh, the people we want to do something differently to do something differently? So who might that be? That might be the, the, the vendors who are developing it or it might be the organizations that are using it. But if they're still getting their pipeline of thousands of candidates and they're still getting what they perceive to be a high quality candidate uh, on, the, uh, you know, on the job, uh, there's little incentive to change. So it seems like there might need to be some sort of regulation, some sort of um, external incentive to ensure we're doing this properly. OK, 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> and and who, do we know, uh, Sarah, you talked about this, about some of the, we, it's, un, it's not transparent what's going on in these. And I mean, where should that transparency be? And should it be open? And, and should there be candidate feedback? I mean, I know some of the systems do give candidate feedback. Um, but, but where should that transparency lie? I mean, I think it's it's important to you know note that at already there are lots of job candidates out there who are being evaluated by these systems and being excluded by these systems without ever knowing that a human never looked at their application. Um, and so I think that you know transparency is an important first step um, because you you know you can't know if there was a, a flaw in the data or you know something that that could be corrected. Uh, but I think that it's really only the, the first step of many. Um, I think another, another critical point um, to take into consideration is, you know, in, in the specific context of hiring, um, there are power asymmetries that make it so that candidates, you know, it's, it's not, you know, like in, in a scenario where you're on an even playing field between the applicant and the employer. Um, like it, it's going to be hard, even things if things are transparent, to you know, as an applicant, be able to say, "Well, I opt out," um, because that essentially means you're not applying for the job. Like it's it's going to be a, a rare situation. You're, you're sort of self-selecting out, and so I think in moving beyond transparency, it's thinking more deeply about you know what would a uh, you know a uh, privacy conscious or consent conscious process um, look like that would ensure that, you know, those those asymmetries between the applicant and the employer are are, are managed in ways that like really enhance workers' rights. <clears throat> and I think as you said earlier, um, with, with many candidates and one employer, very difficult for them ever to pool the information to say, wait a minute, this group is always, we're always being excluded or we're being passed over or filtered out um, uh, until somebody internally, I suppose, spots it and says, um, that's what's happening. And yes, and it's how, how you set the rules. I mean, I was reading that uh, one of the companies that uses this, say they, in a 25 minute video interview, will collect between five and 12,000 data points. And then, it, well, that's interesting. So it's all the time you spend between er uh and um and how many words you use, and the vocabulary and your tone and all of this. Um, quite what you do with it. I think, Kiati, that was your point. You, you can collect as much data as you like, but how do you know what's important? Um, just before, just to leave recruitment for a minute, I, I, I think some of you have been researching out how it's then used internally in organisations because then they, they use it for their current staff. And start looking at uh, promotion and, um, and and whether they'll survive. Do you want to um, talk about some of that, uh, Sarah and Kiati? You were both nodding. We'll go first, Sarah. I'll, I'll pass to Kiati because I've already spoken a lot. <laughs> well, thanks, Sarah. Um, yes, we are seeing that amongst their customers. So we sell uh, to a wide range of industries. It is a software product for contacts, and we sell it to a wide range of industries from tech, VC, research, think tanks, government. And we're seeing that that even though our product was designed to use for external recruitment, it is being used in random manner by our customers for internal recruitment and internal promotions. And the problem still stands as to what data um, is being used. I'll give you a very simple example. A lot of the data, a lot of the models that we are seeing in the market is built on a, a proxy of an ideal worker. Now in 2021, what is the proxy of an ideal worker? It does not exist. It is very, very difficult to understand that. And it becomes a thought exercise more than anything. So I'm questioning the basis of these models because it is a very difficult exercise to do in practice. And therefore a lot of these models are coming up with outcomes that are not warranted. Hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> we are I should think every at least every month we get approached in, in my department with organizations that have got the solution of a piece of software that will sit between, in our case, students and employers. And all we have to do is match the information from both 
and then magically a student will be assigned to the best job for them and every time you say well that's the kind of the easy bit to do the difficult bit is 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 the embedding that in the network and and the, and also with with everybody it's looking at um potential and what people are going to develop into uh, all these tools that say at this age you've done a test you are you're good for this but you know we all grow into different jobs especially as you say in 2021 where um, you know, we're all going to have many different jobs. Um, okay, so we talked bias and discrimination. I think we've also touched on privacy and data protection. Um, in some cases, too much privacy. They won't share what you've just given them, but about the data protection and what they can then go and use those data for. Um, Ali, any, uh, you're nodding away there, so any thoughts in that area? Yeah, it, it's definitely a very curious question. You know, it's not something that just arose with the use of AI in these processes. It's definitely something we've always wondered. They have my resume. What are they going to do with it? Uh, you know, they spoke to me and they might know someone in my network. What are they going to tell them about what I said? But that issue becomes even bigger when we think about AI. Uh, and I know there are Continue, continuously evolving regulations globally. I know GDPR is one that is top of mind for many folks in terms of what data are you collecting for me and exactly how do you plan on using it? And I do think with AI, you know, I many years, many years back uh, participated in an asynchronous video interview and I was just wondering what are they, are they looking at what my apartment looks like? Uh, what are they looking at with my face? Uh, what background noises are they picking up? And in addition to just not knowing and wanting to protect my own privacy, it was also a little bit frightening, honestly. You know, people that have uh, smart home speakers in their house sometimes unplug them when, when they're not actively using it because they're afraid of what they're going to pick up on. And I, I think that's definitely something top of mind for many job seekers now is what exactly are they taking from me and how are they going to use it? Because many people don't believe it's just for the hiring process. Right. And how is it going to move on? I mean, well, because well, it will move on into other bits of the organization or maybe other organizations or maybe um, I'm reminded I, I met a, um, an opposite number from a, a, an East Coast US university who was at a careers fair and on the table next to him were some people with um, wraparound shades and black ties and white shirts, clearly from the agency. And he went over and said, is it true you look at people's Facebook posts when you recruit them? And he said, yes, but we always start with the deleted items. So <laughs> anecdotal. Anyway, um, OK, uh, but we were talking about privacy and data protection. Um, Nigel or Sarah, any do you want to come in on those? Just the, 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 the data, um, they go hand in hand. The biggest benefits of machine learning are really uh, getting structured, you know, analyzing unstructured data. And the, most of the unstructured data that we use is uh, out there on the internet. That They call it the digital exhaust we make as we go about our, uh, as we go about our daily lives. But to do it in recruitment and to you know, do it well, you know, what they would do is a job analysis and that job analysis would identify the skills that are required for performance in the job. And then it would map those back to attributes that we want to measure about the individual. And if you start there, that's the, uh, from an IO psychology perspective, the best way to do it. And you may still go astray, but you're less likely to go astray and uh, start gathering data that you don't need or shouldn't have. Ah, yeah. um, Sarah, you were, uh, I think, coming in on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the only other points um, that I'd make beyond what I said earlier about that, that um, the asymmetry between the applicant and the employer and that question of, of you know, is this, you know, essentially like a coercive interaction in which it's it's difficult for the applicant to meaningfully opt out. Um, I'd, I'd just also say that this is this is sort of the, the starting point of a long tail of a collection of data on workers um, that we've seen growing increasingly invasive. And I think again, particularly we've seen 
um, at, with the shift to remote work. Um, so it, it normalizes this notion that your, you know, your employer can, is, is brought into the intimate space of your home. Um, there's, you know, productivity ranking and monitoring software that mm -hmm. will take screenshots of your computer or, you know, measure your attentiveness based on your face in a Zoom call or, um, you know, all of all of these things track your your cursor movements to see whether you're you're actively moving. So we're, we're in a space where um, the extension of the firm into the worker's home is getting really in incredibly invasive um, and with very few guardrails um, to um, to ensure protections. Yeah, frightening and, and, and reflecting a little on what Ali was just saying that when she was being interviewed and worrying about you know what do they think of the flowers or the color of the furnishings you've got or all of those and it's a good it's a, a good point and if, if you have nothing behind you then what's wrong with that person that you're not showing off your your character in that way um, I think I would encourage audience to uh, for questions um, uh, but just before we go that, it, we've, we've talked quite a lot there about the potential downsides, the, the risk on data and bias and discrimination. But we started with um, people being cautiously optimistic. So I'm going to go to you, Kiyoti, since you've just, you're the one who said that, that you have your concerns, but you're cautiously optimistic. So um, as a summary, to, to round off this little section before we go to uh, the audience questions, what, what, what do you think now? Well, we should be adopting a forward view. So what opportunities are present with AI and machine learning in the space of hiring specifically and assessing if we can make reasonable product predictions with high enough accuracy. That is the onus for people like me who are building this technology. But uh, if we're talking about takeaways for people who might be applying for jobs, then 99.9% .9 probability is there is no human who is screening your CV and it is an automated bot. So my advice would be to cram your CV with keywords that match <laughs> the bots for criteria. Right. And the, the clue is when you get the response within three seconds of submitting, <laughs> no human looked at it. Okay. Um, uh, the others can, uh, the rest of you can, can tell us if you're positive or negative as we go through the questions. So I'd encourage uh, audience members if you'd like to post questions in the Q&A um, and I'll look at the, let's take the ones that have been upvoted. There's a couple at the top which do have votes from Paul Weldon. Um, do you have confidence in the evaluative metrics some companies are using? When he's talked to them, standard IO concepts like reliability and validity seem to be absent and he goes on to say, to ask, um, they're continuously updating their algorithm. So what you were tested on this month might be different if you're a candidate next year, as, as well, you know, naturally as things, things evolve. So uh, who'd like to take Paul's question there? Ali. Yeah, I'm happy this was brought up. Uh, something big that I've noticed and when hiring and interviewing other IO psychologists that I've noticed is many big names, startups, and other organizations for using AI in hiring do not have any industrial psychologists on staff or hire them eventually very much in a, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies capacity just to, to lend an air of legitimacy to what they're doing. And the psychometric concepts that are critical and that we have used for many years to form the basis of why we could use these assessments and fairly and ethically are just not there or being implemented. And I, I don't mean to sound condescending when I say this by a lay person who, who, you know, is not necessarily an expert in those areas and can kind of gauge if they're doing it right, but not completely. Uh, and I really encourage consumers, organizations to exercise caution when choosing what provider they'd want to work with because there are many that use IO psychologists and fantastic measurement principles. And there are many that, you know, have very smart people who say I had an idea and this is really cool and this is going to help people and kind of ignore that part as Paul mentioned. Mm -hmm. Who else? Nigel. Yeah, I, I um, like Ali, I'm an IO psychologist by training. So I like to see all of the reliability and validity 
uh, data. I think the challenge is uh, with some of the newer methods is that they don't have analogous concepts like for our kind of internal consistency reliability or retest reliability, which is around kind of the repeatability or the precision of the measurement with, with text mining, you get a one shot run at the CV. It's very hard to tell how good that how good that score is, you know, and then um, I'm, I'd just be very wary of anybody that uh, says, listen, we've de-biased the selection process, zero bias, you know, and you see that a lot. You see, you really do see that a lot. And then the other one that you see is 95% accuracy, you know, and uh, it's just a silly statistic. Anybody who um, spends any time with uh, these sorts of models knows that doesn't make sense. I'd like to jump in there on Nigel's point. It's absolutely right. I mean, that's what we are seeing while we've been selling our software for over four years now. Um, and the question of reliability and validity is really important to us at Applied, which is why we have taken four years to build our data set. We don't use CVs. We don't use Facebook. We don't use LinkedIn. We are testing people on skills, which is the one-on-one IO psychology uh, but it's a hard road because how do you build data sets that are completely devoid or to the extent that you can make it devoid of bias, uh, devoid of personal signifiers, devoid of things that are not relevant to the job. Um, and that's the process that I think most providers don't have time or patience for. And it also doesn't make a lot of money. So you have to wait and be patient. If I can just jump in, I, I would really underscore that at at present, looking broadly across um, providers in this space, we, we just really lack the evidence that we would need to be able to independently verify um, whether and how um, companies are evaluating, validating, testing for reliability, um, the risk of errors influencing their outcomes. Um, and then more broadly, um, you know, we have, you know, some evidence that there is um, there are, are significant problems of bias and discrimination, but the, the field of validating and, and testing um, algorithms is still fairly nascent. We don't really have like the, the clearly defined widespread agreed on industry standards for independent auditing and, and testing. Um, so I, I think there's, there's a long way to go from, you know, creating some sort of transparency, but then also having like independent um, third party assessments rather than relying on, on firms themselves. Nigel. Yeah, I was just gonna build on Sarah's point um, uh, that, that the, the sort of situation we're in isn't something that can be turned around by a single study in a single company. Do you know, it really needs to be what the balance of evidence says across uh, do you know meta analytic evidence, for instance, that analyzes all of the studies and does look at it uh, independently? So that's something to keep in mind too. So that, that, that sounds like a role for academia to independently. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> okay. could be. Could be. Um, let's let's take another question. Uh, Gina Neff of the OII. Um, has asked, it sounds from Sarah's analysis that the power asymmetries are really challenging to solve. Um, uh, what could a recruiting tool that helps workers look like? So I'm going to give a non-response, which is I wouldn't look for a tool. Um, what I would look for is sound policy that shifts the balance of power towards workers. Um, coupled with collective organizing by workers themselves to, um, you know, set standards um, and to, to shift power towards workers. Can I be controversial and object to what Sarah said politely? Because uh, we have collectively thrown the kitchen sink at this problem. We've tried to build policy. We've tried to educate people. In fact, in the US, we've spent billions of dollars on unconscious bias training and AI training and telling people what to do and what not to do. It's just difficult to train our brains and to de-bias ourselves and de-bias systems. And it's important to guardrail humans with decision-making abilities. Uh, and so quite likely there will be a tool in play, uh, but I'm also 
conscious that any tools that are brought in the market have to be validated probably by academic research, uh, if not anything else. Thank you. Uh, this neatly leads us to a, another question which I was going to pick up from um, Patrick Wisnam about quote unquote successful recruitment can't actually be measured until you can evaluate the quality of the output by the, from the candidate, which might be months, years later. Um, uh, whether the candidate's been identified through AI or uh, traditional or old-fashioned systems. So how, how are you measuring how well AI is working for an organization? We've, we talked earlier about it being, we're saving all this money on the recruitment process, maybe we're attracting more candidates, but what measures can we use for your systems? So I don't mind kind of kicking off uh, here, Jonathan. So the, at least the, the areas that I've seen it, uh, the way that I've seen it done is one, they might just try to mirror the recruiter decision. So they'll have a look, did the recruiter hire this person or did the recruiter hire that person? And then they try to predict it. Now, it's, it's, uh, it's not the, the best thing. It's not the best, it's not the worst approach in the world, but it's not the worst either, not the best either, because uh, maybe those recruiters were biased. So, you know, that's an example where you might uh, perpetuate it. But if you do use the system and you decide to measure performance uh, on the job, usually that's something like the, the quantity of work, the quality of work, the timeliness of the work, whether it meets the needs of your stakeholders, and you will collect that through a performance management system, and they'll do some kind of validation study three, three six, nine, 12 months post time. And do you find, just to follow up, does it work better for some roles rather than others? It really does. Yeah, it absolutely does. So in um, my experience, at least, when you have a look at some of the uh, early career, lower skilled jobs where there just might not be a lot, lot to write on the resume for these, for these guys, um, there's nothing to pick up, do you know? But when you go to mid to senior career, highly technical kind of roles. Those people have a lot of things to put on their CV and there's a lot of, uh, you know, words that can be in the job description. So at least in my experience, the kind of accuracy has been a little bit higher on those um, more senior, more technical job roles. Well, you've got more to go on. Ali. And I think it also depends and I think Part of the issue with measuring performance and uh, how nebulous that is, is why Nigel and I still have jobs, uh, but it's gonna have to do with the objectivity of how performance is measured. And I don't necessarily mean that in a negative way, but some jobs, it's very challenging to put numbers or objective data behind it. It's very much an it depends, and that's gonna pose an additional challenge. So if it's a salesperson, we could say how many units did they turn over compared to how many yeah. we maybe expected them to and accordingly rate the quality of the ai system if it's not that type of job you know if it's an elementary school teacher perhaps how are we going to say this worked better with really clear and objective measures of what their performance looks like can't exactly survey you know six-year-olds to find out what they think so there's definitely different challenges with different roles Great, thank you. Um, the next question that's been voted up is around, um, can you give us some examples of people who are doing this well? Anyone come to mind? I mean, I, I mentioned uh, Unilever earlier, they talked about the numbers that they are um, pr pr processing. The large corporations typically attract thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of applicants. So in a way, they're being forced down this route to, to gain the fit to, well, to be able to cope with the, the demand. But are there some other groups that you've come across that are exemplars? <laughs> Kiati, who I, feel, I feel like I can't plug myself in, but shameless plug. Um, we work with a lot of customers who are very conscious and intentional about the problem. Mm -hmm. And we talked about efficiency being a big problem that AI solves. And that's true. But a lot of the customers we sell to understand that that is not 
the only problem. That is just one of the parameters. And at Applied, we exist to break the myth that there is a trade-off between efficiency of hire, quality of hire, and the speed, and, and the diversity and inclusion. So we're trying to come at it from all angles, because you could take a problem from any of the angles. Um, and we are very fortunate to work with some of the most exciting and avant-garde customers who understand the, the outcome needs to be very intentional. So we work with the likes of charities in the UK, such as Comic Relief, or the biggest publishers such as Penguin Random House. Um, and we're trying consciously to get the outcomes that matter, which is, are we making the teams more representative? Mm -hmm. Are we ensuring that we're not adding any bias in the process and mitigating as much as possible? And ensuring that we're not replicating any of the biases that used to exist in human decision-making. So it's about giving humans the best data that they can make the right decision on. So again, going back to my topic of intersection of human decision making and computer decision making. And, and doing it intentionally, and doing it not intentionally. just devolving all your power over to this box that will do the assignment. Um, we have talked a bit about uh, the potential for bias uh, and discrimination, what have you, whether it's in the system or just structurally in the fact that it's using technology. Um, Esther Debrigeni has asked about that's all very well, she's saying, but incentivizing the use and arguing that as long as there are enough qualified candidates, the candidate pool is short at the moment. Um, we know uh, the FT is reporting 4 million um, uh, short in the US have just left the workforce and other industries, uh, other countries are seeing the same. Um, so the candidate pool is short and often looks not qualified enough for the recruiters. So the biggest challenge is just not having enough people there in the first place. Um, before we get into um, trying to make sure we're not discriminating, what what can how can AI help here? I, I'm going back to my other question about let's is there some positive news here? So Jonathan, I'm not like um, an AI advocate really, but I've seen kind of applications that uh, you know claim to help resolve some of these challenges and. There, there can be skill shortages. That's 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 for sure. Some of the AI systems um, claim to be able to find the candidates. So you have AI systems that will identify people with skills, and then they'll put them onto passive lists, and then they'll kind of call them up when they need them. So that's one kind of thing. But um, also uh, with the matching, you know, I think that there is a lot of kind of people who might have the skills, but they're just not matched up with the right kind of um, employment opportunities. So some AI uh, technology providers claim to do that kind of thing. Okay, so 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 it might help in that in that respect. Maybe. Um, yes, Jim has asked that question. Um, well, I'm, I think as we approach the end of our time here, and before I come to the panel, I um. And I'm just trying to be thinking through what, what have we, can we summarize the opportunities and the challenges in a, a couple of sentences? Uh, that, because I think we focused a bit, quite a bit on the, op on the challenges to this, but um, let, let's try to bring some balance given that the audience started off as being 20% extremely positive and 30% pretty positive and 28% neutral. So that is three, four, five, 78% were neutral to positive. Um, so, uh, have your views changed, panel, having heard each other? Ali, I'll come to you first. Yeah, I mean, the notion of scalability here mm -hmm. is, it, it, that I think is one of the biggest advantages, particularly for job roles that a posting is put up and thousands of candidates are applying. Uh, it, it's just not reasonable to think that one or a few recruiters can sift through all of that much less with quality. And that's not a knock on the recruiter. That's just, you can't look at a thousand resumes and, you know, have the same state of mind for them uh, and, and, you know, the same evaluation quality. So this definitely has the potential to help eliminate a lot of that time so that recruiters can be spending their time on better, more useful activities. And furthermore, the movement in human resources is general, is, in general, excuse me, is towards strategic HR. 
So working towards making critical business decisions, aligning people's strategy with the overall organizational strategy, when HR practitioners don't need to spend as much time solving personnel issues, reading resumes, doing phone screens, they could focus more on that. And that's really improving the employee experience and allowing organizations to set policies that are really going to promote fairness, promote a good work experience. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm old enough to remember uh, a role I had um, in, a, in a publishing house in London where there was an excellent HR person. It's the only time it's ever happened who did do not just the personnel pieces, as you described, it took the time to plan people's careers and to talk about progression and those sorts of plans, which, which is really where HR adds huge amounts of value. Um, Sarah, challenges and opportunities? I think, what do you think? Sure. I, I think that a place of particular opportunity, I, I would actually challenge, I think, I can't remember where this came up earlier, but there was someone said that the genie, the genie is already out of the bottle here. Um, I think that the opportunity here is to take steps that will meaningfully shift the playing field around the use of hiring assessments um, and to put the onus on both the technology companies creating these systems, but also the firms using them to ensure that workers' rights are protected, um, both in hiring practices and in the development acquisition and the use of, of these technologies that are already in use, making sensitive determinations that really affect people's lives. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Nigel. Yeah, so for, for me, the, the opportunities really are around that scalability that uh, that Ali was talking about. We can offer, uh, you know, responsiveness. So it's not just being used in recruitment. They're using chatbots, for instance, in HR service centers. And previously, you might not have been able to get hold of somebody when you needed to get a hold of somebody, but now the chatbot can kind of answer it. So there are these applications that you might be able to use it for. I just think that you need to be careful. And, and it was actually uh, me, Sarah, that said the genie was out of the bottle. And I do think it's out there, but that's certainly not to say I don't think that we can shape the direction that we, uh, that we push these, uh, these applications in. That's encouraging. And um, Kiati, you obviously think there are lots of opportunities here. Perhaps you could- I still remain optimistic. <laughs> yes, but I, I the thing, uh, a clear understanding what, of what AI entails is very important. We need more bosses, more managers, more leaders mm -hmm. to understand how AI is progressing and the implications for their businesses and their customers, and both regarding opportunities to exploit or risks to minimize. And understanding that and how that applies in the workforce and bear in mind it will impact every sector so it will be sector agnostic how to train test and supervise ai that will be incredibly useful i think that creates multiple opportunities for people especially for women who want to work in tech because we know there is very little representation of women in tech uh, and i think that's a huge opportunity great and now i get to my question which is as the final question we have about, when the survey was done, we had about 20% of the audience are students. And I doubt, doubtless there are other people on the call who will be facing um, interviews soon, uh, if the great quit or the great resignation is to be believed. Um, so what's your advice? And Kiati, you said 99% of people will be facing AI in those roles, but what is your, each of you, what's your one piece of advice to people who are going to be facing somewhere in that, in that line um, an AI assessment of their application. Um, let's start, Ali, let's, let's come to you first, if I may. Sure, so uh, I think it still holds conventional wisdom states, you should be tailoring if you're writing a cover letter, but also your CV or resume to the role you're applying for, which isn't to say lie, but really <laughs> highlight those oh, features of your, yeah, no, don't do that. Uh, highlight those features of your past experiences that are aligned with what the job ad or the job description says. And that definitely still holds here, perhaps even more strongly, if you know something is gonna be looking for keywords. and are, is this person's experiences aligned to mm -hmm. what we're looking for in the job? So I'd say double down on the advice that has been given in the past, really customize your CV uh, to suit the job you're applying for. Okay. 
excellent. Nigel. Yeah, I think my advice would be to, in addition to getting the CV uh, tailored for video interviewing, it would be rehearse. So before, you, you know, don't let the um, first time you've gone through what you're going to say be on the video interview, you know, so I'd reverse. And I'd also look at rehearse, look for signals that they're likely to be a good employer. Are there, um, is there accommodation or adjustment for people with disabilities? Can you get hold of somebody if you needed to, to talk about, uh, you know, an alternative application channel, if this particular way doesn't work for you? Those kind of things might signal that you're applying to a, to a, to a decent organization. Nice, thank you. Yes, preparation is all. I read someone recently saying, you do not rise to the occasion, you fall to your level of preparedness. Um, so, Kiati. Well, Jonathan, not too long ago, I was in the position of applying for jobs. So um, I hope to God I don't have to write a CV again, ever. But <laughs> for those, those who are in the process, I feel the pain. Um, but instead of giving you advice on CV writing, I'd probably say, as Sarah said, for the longest time, power has been held in the hands of employers. And there is something you can do to seize a little bit of it back is to do your due diligence on the employer. So in the interview process, ask them for what they are looking for, what their process looks like, how inclusive they are, what tools they're using and why they're using the AI tools that they claim to be using. Um, and some of that will give you more information, if not anything else, to make a better decision. Yes, it is a two-way process. And Sarah? I actually quite agree. And I, I was actually just going to share this resource that a couple of my colleagues at the AI Now Institute put together, um, which is a guide for students to interview recruiters. Um, so to take this as an opportunity to really scrutinize the firm that you're potentially going to be joining um, and, and use the leverage that you have, um, particularly students who are coming from a place like Oxford, um, to use their leverage to shape how these companies operate to, and to speak upwards about what matters to you, um, if that's diversity, if that's the ethics of the technologies that a firm is building, um, and so on. So that's, I think it's a, a unique opening um, to try and shape um, the place that you're you're considering being a part of. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, well, that, that's really helpful. That's in the chat. And you're right, the students of today and the graduate students who are going out to work have more power than they think. Um, here at Oxford, we probably have about nine or 10,000 vacancies on a system and about three or 4,000 people who leave and go into work. And they don't all go through our system. So there are, you know, they're, they're in demand. And, and therefore they can exert some of that power to say, what are your policies on sustainability, on discrimination, on d diversity and so on. Um, and, uh, although, you know, uh, as Kiati said, it's going through the job hunting processes does feel asymmetric at times. Um, we have reached the end of our time. I'm sorry we didn't get to quite all the questions there. So thank you all very much. And I'm going to hand back to Clemmy. Thank you so much to all the panelists for your fascinating insights tonight. And thank you audience for attending. Um, I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you guys, that was great.